Well, good morning. It is good to see all of you here this morning. So I want to tell you how, uh, how blessed we are this morning. We have two different styles of worship that are absolutely beautiful. So I'm here, I had the pleasure of being here Thursday as, uh, as the choir was, was practicing, and it kept flowing down the hallway, and it drew me like a magnet. Uh, the ladies, are, it's, it's pleasant and beautiful to the ear while the guys bring some power behind the scenes. I just had to come and sit and listen for a while. So, so I just want to say thank you to both teams, especially our choir this morning, for leading us in worship and the great glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about church, pretty much. Pretty much about church. And, here, and this, this is the, the thing. Every pastor of every gospel-preaching church is battling the same issue. Right? Every elder board is battling the same issue. How do we deal with things that the uh, government or communities are trying to impose upon churches? And here's what I'm going to tell you. Today is an overview. It is not directed at any single person because I don't really know of anything that's still going on at this point in time. But I want to lay these things out there. In the first week, I, I told you I would try to give you my process of how we go about things and how I go about things, and I'm going to do this biblically this morning uh, and try to give it to you as clearly as I, possible can, as I possibly can. I want to tell you that uh, I appreciated every single conversation I had this week. It was a blessing to the soul. From those of you who poured out heartaches to, to convictions or just laughter, what a blessing it is, and that is called sweet fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it? Things that we so desperately need. Uh, but before I begin, I just I want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, this morning we're talking about a tricky subject. It's a subject that no one agrees upon in its entire certainty of how to proceed. Lord, but you know our direction that we need to go. Father, I don't have the right words. I need your words this morning. Lord, I don't want my opinions or perspectives to, to enter in and cloud. May it just be straight from your word. Because that's what we need to lean on. Father, as we open it, there's a lot that you have brought this morning, and I pray that uh, you would bring to our ears the things we need to hear. Lord, and we just trust you fully because you are a faithful God, completely trustworthy. I just ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to listen to this whole thing, right? Because I'm going to challenge every single person's perspective that sits here today. And the whole goal of that, the reason for that, is to try to get you to think of a bigger picture and keep that in mind. I'm not here to change your biblical conviction at this point in time. I don't know if it needs changing but I want you to analyze what those things are. And I want you to see if they line up with the scriptures that we will be talking about today. So here's what happened to me this week. Tuesday, I read an article that I'm going to share with you, just some highlights, that deeply disturbed my soul. Right? I'm, I'm, my heart is burdened, but yet I am filled with joy to be here with everybody. And it's weird how the Spirit of God works like that, but I love it. Uh, but I want to share this article with you. And this is where it all started, and then it's going to go into a little more depth. There was a pastor in Canada who came out as a transgender pastor. He was a Baptist pastor. And here's what I want to tell you. God loves people. And we're going to love people. You agree with that? That's right. But here's what happened. Before I even read these things to you, Christianity is being attacked. Real, gospel-believing Christianity is being attacked. And these three things will highlight what I'm talking about. Here is uh, uh, a statement from uh, the, this transgender individual. 
It says, I want to proclaim to my transgender siblings that I believe in a God who knows your name, even if that name hasn't been chosen yet. I believe in a God who calls you a beloved daughter, even if your parents insist you'll always be their son. So you're trying to, you see the perspective that is going on already. I believe in a God that will see me however I want to be. Right? This article is not about God, and I want to point this out to you. This is not about Jesus Christ. It's not about God the Father. Is it about a self-serving interest? And this is why I say Christianity is being attacked, because more and more supposed Christians are trying to claim God and how they want God to be instead of who God is. It goes on. It says, this exact debate between embracing queer Christians, now this is the article, I did not write this, I'm just quoting this, okay? So between embracing queer Christians and rigidly adhering to traditions that might be out of date is at the center of arguments across Christian denominations right now, says the writer of this article, and I agree with that. We are talking about these things. But here's the problem. What we're seeing now is a kind of struggle in the conscience of people who have always believed that there was something wrong with gender and sexuality. Variant people suddenly realizing that. In fact, no, the question is not the worthiness or the worth of these people or the lives they live. The question is actually the sinfulness of homophobia. Let me point this out to you. God did not make a mistake when he created people exactly how they were. Never. We we have to understand that. But we are being accused of by holding to what exactly the Bible says is, if you disagree with me, it's sin. It's sin. That's all it is. You disagreed with me, so therefore it is sin. How many disagreements do we have with one another? Right? Man, we got a lot of repenting to do, I guess, because that's, uh, that's, str- <laughs> that's some struggles there. So, but it goes, a, it, goes, it goes a step further, and this is what really broke me. Christianity, this is this writer's perspective combined with this transgender Baptist pastor. So Christianity has had to change in some enormous ways over the last 150 years, and it's going to change more. Either stories like mine are going to invite the church to change, or it will die, at least in the way we know it. That's sad in some ways, but the church constantly needs to die and be resurrected. That's our story. That's the gospel that is being presented, not just in Canada, but all around the world. Here's what I'm going to tell you. The church does not die. Jesus Christ said very clearly, no one will stand against my church. No one. Because no one is going to defeat Jesus. Okay, these, so as we, as we look at this perspective, I need you to understand this morning, we are fighting a ginormous spiritual battle. It is a big spiritual battle. And here's the goal. The goal of the natural man, and you're going to hear me reference this a few times, but the natural man is that man who is yet, man or woman, who is yet to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It's the sin-led person. Okay? Now here's the goal. It's to cut people off from the light and the life of God. That's Satan's goal. You worship me, and you don't get eternal life. Right? That's, That's the whole point. And the result is, Eternal darkness for everybody who believes in that sort of thing. And yet it's being embraced in a great and mighty way. After I read this, I needed some encouragement all week long. uh, Because it was just heavy on the soul. And it came in, in many conversations. And God is so good when we need things the most. It came. And then on Friday, Sid and I had an experience. God reminded us needy people. As we were in here, and a lady directly off the street couldn't tell you who it is, walked into the street, not or walked into the church. As we were dealing with some internet stuff, doors happened to be unlocked at that point in time. She didn't know why she came here. We didn't know why she was here, and it was very hard to figure out how she was communicating. 
due to all the extra things that were going on in her life. But it was a simple reminder that people need Jesus. People need Jesus. And this is what we were all about. And this is where God brought Psalm 16. And I'm going to go through several pieces of scripture with you today. So if you have notes or pen, you're going to want to take some notes. And I encourage you to study this on your own afterward. Or perhaps even listen again if you can't write as fast as I go. My wife yells at me all the time. You do not give me enough time to write notes. All right, so I just want you to listen to me twice. That's all. But Psalm 16, and I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation, because I like a couple of the wording changes, but if you want to follow with me, Psalm 16, eight verses, or verses 8 through 11, and I read this during prayer time. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and pleasures of living with you forever. I know that the Lord is always with me. What a powerful statement. I hope you can make that statement today. And even in your struggles, if you are struggling today, and again, I don't know what you're going through, just as Bert was talking about, but if you are struggling and you know Jesus Christ, you can claim this statement. I know that I will not be shaken. I will know that I will not be moved from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we look at this in a big war, right? Sometimes we, our perspective gets skewed a little bit and we focus on battles, skirmishes, because that's where we are, that's what we're fighting, that's what we do. However, my job as a pastor is to focus on the war and help prepare you for the big war. So that way you can fight all the battles that come along. And here's what I'm going to tell you today. Here's the struggle. The great war is not about what you think your rights are. It is not about what you think your civil liberties are. The great war is the salvation of your soul and the salvation of souls all around you. The things I just mentioned are the battles that we have to fight along the way, but it is not why we come together on Sunday morning to worship Jesus Christ. And this is where the church has become influenced over the time. Yes, we are going to take stands. Yes, we have to fight for certain things. But we come here to worship Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's why we're here. Do you agree with this? I hope so. Right? I hope so. Because it is God who's going to change things. It is God who will transform us along the way. And there's plenty of things that are happening. There are plenty of things that are happening in our community, and in our, in our state, and even on the country level. And we're going to talk about a few of those things. But those are battles and not the actual war. And if we get lost in the battles, you fail to see God working in the whole situation. Right now, here's a couple of the battles that we're facing publicly. Social injustice is now the leading thing we need to fight, right? So now in church, we're going to talk about who's racist. Or we're going to talk about who's uh, overly feministic in the movement. Or or whose sexual rights are, are trying to lead the way. These are not things that lead us in victory. The gospel of Jesus Christ leads us in victory. And it is the gospel that we bring when we have those battles in those areas. Because it is the gospel that softens hearts, that transforms people. It is really a war for the kingdom of God, the supremacy of the gospel, for the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is what we are fighting for. And by the way, he rides in on a white horse and conquers us in the end, and you and I are going to go to heaven for those that know Jesus. We know the end. We just have to prepare for the middle. Right, until God takes us home. Well, in Ephesians 6, 12 and 13, here's the war. I just want to remind you. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, 
you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We need to stand. First and foremost, before we take any other stand, we stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the fight. Number one. And then based off of your giftings and your convictions, God may have you fight some of these other battles along the way. But we as a church are going to fight the biggest battle that we have, and it's the spiritual one. It is the spiritual one. It's a fight between good and evil. It's a fight for the hearts and souls of all mankind. It's a fight that the natural man is fighting against very hard. Very hard. It is the name of Jesus that offends people more than anything else. It is God's commandments that people find ridiculous in the world. Failing to see that is what gives them life and sets them free. But remember this. Were we not there at one point as well? Did we need not a, a, a group of people to help influence us with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was God not faithful with his spirit to lead us in that direction? So let me explain to you what the natural man is, since I keep referring to it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of, Christ, or mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. This is what we're fighting against every time we walk out into the world. They don't understand. They don't understand the things that are going on. And I, I will tell you this very truthfully, we can't expect them to understand. They don't have the Spirit of God inside of them. They cannot discern the things that are spiritual. You and I have gained understanding in different areas of our life. And by the way, we're always growing and changing in that understanding and increasing in that knowledge because the Spirit of God reveals it to us. Until that happens in their life, they're not going to understand the spiritual world and the battle that is going on. That Christianity is the worship of the one true God, and his answer for the world is Jesus Christ. Right? It's the same Jesus who was born as a man. It's the same Jesus who died as a lamb. It's the same Jesus who rose from the grave and is currently seated as a king at the right hand of God. It's the same Jesus who had no sin in his body, but became sin when he died on the cross to pay a penalty that he never deserved, but we did. It's the same Jesus who was buried for three days, who rose from the grave with his burial clothes still intact, and the handkerchief around his head was folded in a separate place, signifying, I will return. The same Jesus who reappeared to over 500 people as proof of his resurrection. It's the same Jesus who ascended to heaven, defeating death and fulfilling promises of eternal life, giving us eternal life. It's the same Jesus who in the book of Revelation does not return only as the savior of the world, but also as the judge and the king. Ready to confront sin. Amen. We cannot expect the world to understand that Christianity and God's, world, God's word is not a list of do's and don'ts, but true freedom from sin. They need to see it. That's our responsibility. They need to see it, lived out. I'm going to give you some examples of things to think about. Israel. All through the Old Testament, Deuteronomy Exodus, well, Exodus through Deuteronomy, you would really read about it quite a bit. God saves them from Pharaoh, and yet they complained because they don't want to follow God's standards. They wanted to worship their desires instead of a holy God, and eventually God gives them their promised land anyway. Praise the Lord, God is faithful when we are not. But they do the exact same thing. And here's the claim. The summarized Steve version of the claim. 
I don't want to be set apart. I want to live like all the other people around me, even though, God, you told me not to. Does this sound familiar to you? What did God do? He gave them exactly what they desired. He temporarily removed his presence and hand of blessing from his chosen people, and here is the results. They were taken captain, they were taken captive under years of bondage and slavery, fought countless wars, and have experienced a life without God, even though God is faithful to his people and will redeem his nation once again. But there are many people who were led nowhere but to ruin and death as a result of their choice. And I tell you, it was their choice to say, I don't need you, God. Well, let's look at our own world, current, our own country, and our current state. We were in the same place. We needed redemption. We needed saving. God gave us Jesus Christ. He says, you know what? I'm going to give you my son. It's time. The world can be redeemed. The Jesus who set us free from bondage, from death, from the separation of his presence, from God's presence, the Father's presence. And here's what we did. Generally speaking, we rejected God's answer. And we ultimately asked for the same thing the Israelites did. Our life was better in slavery. Our life was better before Jesus, before your word, before I had to follow all of your rules, God. We reject your idea of deliverance, God. Is this not the claims that we hear today? Are these not the battles that we see in our world? Well, God, doing the exact same thing, he gave us exactly what we desired. He temporarily removed his presence of hand of blessing from our nation. And as a result, we are spiritually taken captive. Years of bondage and slavery to sin, we fought countless wars, and a life without God, again, leads nowhere to ruin and death. Life is better. Here's the final claim. Life is better without this so-called savior of the world because he doesn't give me what I want. Or he doesn't allow me to live the way I want, to love who I want. That's the big one that we hear right now. Or to change myself in the way that I want because I think I know better than God. It is weighty on the soul. We have a mission as God's people. We have a mission. So I want to remind you not to get lost in the battles that you see around you today. There's a war for people's souls, and Jesus is the only answer that they have. Just because people reject him now doesn't mean they're going to reject him forever. Amen? How many times did we reject Jesus Christ before we finally submitted and said, God, I need you. I need your answer. How many times did we do that today after knowing Jesus No, I think I know better. I'll I'll do it my own way. All right, God, I am uh, reminded once again, you know better. We're heading that direction. And this is our hope, that some might be saved. We know that everybody is not going to believe in Jesus Christ, but we are faithful till the end. Our mission is called to be faithful till the end so that some might be saved. What a great hope. So how do we fight this war? Because we're looking for weapons, we're looking for strategies, we we have to figure this out on a regular basis. Well, thankfully, the Word of God lays everything out for us. Isn't that wonderful? 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6, says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. For though we walk in the flesh, nowhere in the New Testament will you see that God says, pick up your sword and strike down your enemies all around you. He tells you to do the exact opposite. Love your enemies so that they may be saved. Share with them the gospel. Our weapons are great and mighty, 
They're not of the flesh. They're not of our will. They're of God's will. And I want to encourage you this. I just want to remind you, all right, very powerfully, do not un underestimate the power of prayer. Right? Do not underestimate the power of prayer, because that is the first thing we are called to do in preparations, in battles, in fights, and everything else that, that God wants us to do. Pray and pray hard. I don't know if we as Christians across America have prayed hard enough for the leaders of our country. We've complained about them plenty. I am extremely guilty. Okay? This, I'm leading this thing. It's, it's a conviction of mine. But have we prayed enough for their salvation to change and perhaps their leading in that direction? We have to walk with confidence in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We must believe, as God's Word says, that the gospel is powerful to change any person, no matter what their past is, right? We have to, we have to believe that. We have to be students of the Word of God. As it says here, we are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. If you don't know the Word of God, you can't talk about the Word of God, and you can't have a nice conversation with people about things they may differ on. We have to be ready to defend why we believe in Jesus Christ. Have you ever been asked that question? Why do you believe in Jesus? I want to know. Usually it comes out very forcefully. Sometimes it comes out a little bit less. But I want to know why you believe in Jesus. Great. Favorite subject. Let me tell you why. This is what God has done for me. That's where we should be. With joy. With a smile. Expecting that the response is probably not going to be a favorable one in the first conversation, but hoping that eventually it will be. We have to believe that his word is exactly what God says, that is truthful, that it sets us free. We have to be obedient to Jesus Christ in the commands of the gospel. And we're going to look at a few of those. Currently in our own country, there's no doubt we're struggling with current mandates handed down by those in government authority over us. We believe that each church has the autonomy to govern itself and not be governed by another church. So therefore, each church is facing the same battle with different persecutions. We have to understand that. For example, in the state of California, as you know well, John MacArthur's church, Grace Community Church, had to take a stand against a state mandate that says you're not allowed to meet. They did this over much time, much prayer, and they eventually said, we are going to meet, and wrote a seven-page document that says, this is why we are respectfully refusing your mandate and honoring God. And there's a reason for this, because there's three distinct governing bodies laid out for us in Scripture, and we need to understand that. There's the family. My authority does not go beyond my own family. No matter how much I would like to go into other kids' households and correct them, <laughs> it still exists within mine, right? And I know I'm not the only one. I had some fun plane rides with kids that I just wanted to reach out and <laughs> show them the love of God, I guess. But then there is the church. There are leaders and elders that are assigned over the church. And their function is to govern and to help lead the church body itself. It does not really go into the family authority structure, even though we step over into one another. We are responsible for the body of the church. Fathers are responsible for leading their households. And if father is not there to be found, then mothers are responsible for leading the household. And when both are together, they do it as one. Right? They do it as one. But then you have the state and government. And this is the, re the responsibilities to the oversight and protection of civic peace, economics, and lawful justice. I'm going to read a statement to you from John MacArthur of what they wrote just on that little section. It says, God has not granted civic rulers authority 
over the doctrine, practice, or polity of the church. And that is extremely truthful. We believe that here. The biblical framework limits the authority of each institution to its specific jurisdiction. The church does not have the right to meddle in the affairs of individual families and ignore parental authority. Parents do not have the authority to manage civil matters while circumventing government officials, and similarly, government officials have no right to interfere in ecclesiastical matters in a way that undermines or disregards the God-given authority of pastors and elders. That is where we stand here. And we're just a minute, we're going to lay out some scripture about how we decide things as a church. Because right? I told you before, I'm going to, as I said before, I'm going to try to lay out all these understanding processes so you can try to understand our, our thinking and my thinking. Here's the great statement. And there are two sports players, one in baseball and one in the NBA, who took the stand. One of the greatest statements I have heard in a long time, we do not bow to anybody but Jesus Christ. That is where we are. That is who we are as a church. That does not mean we are not called to respect other individuals or other institutions. And man, that is a fine line at times. But this is why. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. Therefore God has also highly exalted him who is Jesus and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's why we're here. We willingly bow to the King because we love him, because we want to worship him. And we should openly and joyfully confess and profess the name of Jesus Christ. Instead of going into a store or walking down the street, are you a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. In our mind, we're thinking, I don't know if I have enough time to talk with this guy. But really, it's the opportunity of opportunities. Are you? Yes, I am. What would you like to know? I'd be glad to answer anything I possibly could. Normally, people run away at that point in time. But it's okay. It is okay. Because they're not running away from you. They're running away from God. And that means the gospel is working, by the way. The gospel draws and directs people away, just out of the hardness of people's hearts. But we're in a spot now in our country where we can't use certain words because of negative connotations. We've got to tear things down. We've got to change words. You're not allowed to say certain things in, the, in social conduct. Here's the big one can't mention the word slavery. I'm going to. I'm going to because scripture says it. And I'm going to do it unapologetically. And here's why. In Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Do we not know that we are going to serve one or the other? We are either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. We are bound by one or set free by the other. It says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Here's the thing. It is mind-boggling to understand. You ever try to understand the full complexity of the mind of God? You ever had those conversations in the car when it's just you? God, what are you doing? I don't know what's going on. Well, here's, here's how God's greatness works. When we let go of sin and grab on to Jesus, righteousness sets us free to live a life more pleasing than anything we could partake here on the earth. But it doesn't seem like that to the lawless mind, to the carnal mind, to the natural mind. It seems like 
I should be able to participate in any desire I have because I'm free to do so. That's not freedom, that's slavery to sin. That's the complexities of the truth of God. That's the, that's the, the wonderfulness of the spirit that he delivers from us. And that is binding truth that is laid out for us by the Apostle Paul, directed by Jesus Christ. You're either going to worship one or you're going to worship the other. And I pray that you're going to worship Jesus today. We're going to praise God that we're delivered from bondage, from slavery. When's the last time you just said, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from sin? By the way, I confess I have got some sin in my life and I need some deliverance here today too. Right? That's part of our normal conversation. In verse 18, it's free to live in the righteousness of God. In verse 19, it's lawlessness is sin and it leads to death. But righteousness of God leads to life found in God's holiness, his ultimate standard. Right? That's, that's our measuring. That's who we're being compared to. That is our, our, our commands or our standard. That is our bar that we are reaching. Here's where I'm going to get a little uh, community-minded. Seattle, Portland. Lawlessness. You may disagree with me at certain points. I don't care. It's lawlessness. They want to be self-governing. And they're doing it through violence. And that tells you exactly what they are after. The touchy subject that few people want to address publicly because of uh, some harsh words coming back to them is Black Lives Matter. The answer is this, all lives matter. Yes, black lives do matter. There's no doubt because God created every single person in his image. We all matter. The movement itself, the people behind the movement itself, is not a righteous act. And their first action is rebellion and violence themselves. They are seeking freedom through lawlessness. The spiritual war we're fighting here is real. I cannot tell you this in, a, in, a, in, a, in any more stronger words. It is real. So how do we address this here at First Baptist of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota? We're going to get specific. How do we do this? How does Scripture tell us to do this? Well, first of all, it starts with your leaders. It starts with me, and it starts with your elders. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, it says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. We have a responsibility. It's like a swear word in, in, in the world around us. Responsibility, who wants to be responsible nowadays? Right? Here is our responsibility. In there, there's two things. Number one is to feed the church with the word of God. This is what we're going to do. The straight word of God. This is exactly what it says. We're not going to water it down. We're not going to make you feel better with it. It is God's word that does the transforming. It is not me or any other elder. It is God himself. But that's our call. We have to feed the church with the word of God. This is why we gather together as a fellowship, as a body, so we can corporately worship God through the preached and taught word of God, through the singing of the word of God that we had before. There's a second one. We are called to live a Christ-like life worthy of imitating, as it says, whose faith follow or whose faith, uh, uh, whose faith imitate, considering the outcome of their conduct. And because we are imperfect people, sometimes we don't get that right all the time. And we need the grace and forgiveness of Jesus just like every single person. But this is our responsibility if we do these two things according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then there comes a responsibility of the body. In Hebrews, just a few verses down, same chapter in 13, verse 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account, and let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. As I stand here today, I'm not going to tell you that you're doing this wrong or right because we're just getting to know each other. 
I'm giving you the warning. I'm giving you what Scripture has to say. And the responsibility that comes from this is to obey and to submit. But I want to tell you this. It is not a blind following. Just because somebody said it, we have to go do it. That is not what Scripture is referring to. That is why we started with pastors and elders. Our responsibility comes first before the body's responsibility comes. But it is a responsibility that if you obey and submit as a body, it's for the health of you and it's for the health of the church. It's for the spiritual blessing of all around. But not everybody likes the word submit. Isn't it one of the greatest things that we struggle with, with our own personal walk with Jesus Christ? Submission. But our burden of responsibility is high. It is extremely high. And here's why. The elders here have to give an account for the entire church. The entire church. Every decision that is made or not made, we will give an account for. Myself, as a pastor, have to give an account for the church and the elders. That's a lot of responsibility. We take this extremely seriously. Just as the warning in James 3 says, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And this is where we are, because God has placed us here. And I'm going to tell you, every decision that is made and will be made in the future is going to be compared with Scripture for the overall health of the body. There's going to be people that don't agree, and that's why we have conversations so we can discuss some things. There's three groups of people. You need to understand that at the moment. There are people who are overly cautious and afraid and live and trapped by fear with the current COVID stuff that are going on. We are called to be cautious, by the way. But I'm on the extreme side. We have the other side, on the extreme side, that just wants to say no to everything. And in the middle, we have to hide both. Caution and a stand for Jesus Christ. Those lines are fine, and we have to have the wisdom of God to be able to choose when to do it and how to do it. And here's where our biblical measuring standards come into play. Every single Sunday, how we worship on Sunday gets compared to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Here's our four commandments and statutes. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Number one is the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, just as we talked about. If we're not preaching the Word of God, we're preaching some other gospel. And we are not going to have that. It cannot be if we are going to be faithful. We have fellowship with one another. This is why we are gathered together. We need fellowship. We need fellowship. Here's my concern, and this is what we're looking at as a board. How can we increase this with the current problems that we are facing. Right, we don't have all the answers yet. I'm not going to claim to have all the answers yet. We have the third one, which is communion. We figured that problem out. We're having communion in September, if not before then. As soon as stuff gets delivered here, we're going to be having communion. And then the last one is, is prayer. No matter what happens in our country, nation, or in your individual life, no one can take the ability to pray away from you except for you. No one can take that away. And that's where we are. We are going to measure everything, every standard, every regulation against those four things because we're here to worship Jesus Christ. And there are some limitations that are trying to be instilled upon us. Yes. But does that stop our worship of Jesus this morning? Absolutely not. There are things that I don't like. Don't think that I don't like them. There are things that you don't like. I know of some of them. I'm sure you'll be faithful to tell me the rest. And I look forward to it, actually, because then I know exactly where you are. This is what I love about this church. You are passionate about your convictions. But we just have to be careful. There are some limitations on where our passion takes us here and there. Things might look a little different. Things in our world are changing. 
The government, there is no doubt, is trying to put its hands in every little thing that the church is doing, and they have no response to do so or no, no, no ability to do so. But these are the biblical mandates that we follow. And we're going to compare any standard that we want to take or any direction that we want to take and how it might look. Can we fulfill these four things? As soon as we cannot do so is when we're going to change directions here as a church. And we're right on the edge, by the way. We're right on the edge. I pray for the... I pray for the freedom of church regularly. But why should we be taken off guard if the church becomes persecuted? Did not Jesus promise this? Hasn't the underground church been fighting this for hundreds of years, if not longer? And by the way, it is through this persecution that the gospel actually reigns at a greater level. It has a greater impact. So I want to change your perspective this morning, past the things that we don't like, and this is for me, as well as for you, but this is for me too, and to see the opportunities that God has placed in front of us to minister and worship and love one another through these things. Hebrews 13 tells us the reason why, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. We love God through worship and obedience to his commands, just as Matthew 22 says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Worshiping God together on a Sunday morning fuels us for an impact on loving people during the week. That's the whole point. That's one of the points, anyway. We need it. We absolutely need it. This is why God says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And I'm telling you, that day is approaching. And it seems to be picking up speed. We need each other. We need encouragement. We need one another to stir up some, some love, some compassion, even some strong conviction from different times. But we may need to change our perspectives at different, different moments. To not see stumbling blocks and biblical hindrances but instead looking at them as opportunities to spread the gospel in a, in, in a new way, where people are actually at. If you've noticed, people are asking more about Jesus lately. Amidst all of the struggles that you hear in the media, and if you're one of those media guys, please stop watching the news all the time. Just stay up to date, okay? But all they say is problems. It speaks nothing of hope. This book is hope. That's where we need to be. As we close, take your, take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It gives us a very specific instruction of how we can change our perspective. And I'm speaking to any Christian all around, not just our church, but I will talk to us because we're here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And I'm going to tell you, this is a hard piece of scripture. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, any form of lifting up people and giving of thanks be made for all men. Who does that include? Does that include the people that you don't like or disagree with or would rather see removed from their position? Absolutely it does. Because in verse 2 it says, For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And I'm going to tell you, I have not done this well. I've had moments. But there are people in positions of uh, leadership in our government I don't like. But I don't know who they are as individuals. All I know is I don't like their policies. 
And just because I don't like their policies does not mean I should not lift them up before the throne of grace. We are called to do so. And here's why. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to know the knowledge of the truth. This is what we want from everybody around the world. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And here's that last little bit that goes with it. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And there's two things found in that last verse. Our spirit has to be one of worship when we take a stand. It is because something is being done against the commandments of God, and we love God bigger than that. That's our motive. That's where we are. It can't be done out of wrath. It can't be done out of doubt. It can't be done out of rebellion. It will be done because we love God, and God has commanded us to do these things, and we will faithfully and lovingly do them. But men, it speaks to us very clearly here as well. We are to pray everywhere. There has been a failure in the American church for men to rise up and pray and lead. And here's my challenge for you today. What statistic do you want to be in? Do you want to be found faithful to verse 8, men? Praying passionately, fervently, in secret, in the office, in the car, with the family. Do you want to pray because you want to see a difference made? That's our challenge. It's not a challenge given by me. It's a challenge given by God. It is where we need to be. Lawlessness does not produce righteousness. Wars and battles are one in the preparation. They're fought with courage. They're fought with hope, with faith, and with passion. And our church here at First Baptist of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, must always be measured against the commandments of God. And when that day comes when we are told we can no longer do those four things, or any one of those four things, we will take a stand very boldly and courageously because we love God. It's going to be done from a spirit of love, because we long to worship God, and because we trust him fully. But until that day, we're going to continue to meet, to preach, to fellowship, to live Jesus, and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to continually seek ways to do these things more effectively. We're going to look for opportunities to love people, and when God is faithful, he delivers them through the door. We're going to worship together. And I hope you feel the same way when it comes to loving and worshiping our God. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you, first of all, for sending your son, Jesus Christ. In your sovereignty, you knew we needed an answer that we cannot provide on our own. And then he took our sin, our punishment, and it was nailed there on the cross with him. But he didn't leave it there. Your plan never left it there. Our God lives. He rose from the grave to give us life, to defeat death. Lord, in return, you gave us righteousness, your righteousness, the ability to communicate with you freely. Father, you gave us life because that's your desire. You want all people to be saved. You want all people to find life in your righteousness. Lord, even when we struggle, 
And you know full well, God, my perspective is not always right. I need to be reminded through your word that that is always right. May we hang tight to your commandments, knowing that when we follow you out of love and obedience, we are blessed beyond measure and live a life more glorious than anything we can picture here on this earth. And one day we are going to be sitting next to you, learning directly from you in your presence with no sin in our body. What a blessing and privilege for your children. Father, thank you for reaching out and grabbing hold of us. And if there is one person here who doesn't know you and wants to be a part of your family, may they call out on the name of Jesus Christ right where they are sitting. Say, Jesus, save me. I am a sinner. I need you. I believe that you are the Son of God, my Savior. You took away my sins on the cross and that you have given me eternal life, eternal life. I claim you as Lord. Father, if that is true for somebody here today, I pray they would go up and tell somebody, I've accepted Jesus today. Lord, and for those who, who know Jesus, who are sitting here, Father, help us with our direction as a, as a body, as leaders, as a church. We're going in through some unknown waters, God, and we need your wisdom. But above all, we just want to be faithful to your commandments, to preach and teach the word of God, to fellowship with one another, to share in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, to pray for our government, to pray for people around us, to pray for one another. God, I just want to thank you for choosing First Baptist to be part of that message today, to be, to be the feet and hands of the gospel message. Father, we trust this to you fully and help us be responsible for our portion when we fail. For we know that failure is not final in the hands of Jesus Christ. We ask all of this in the saving grace of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, again, I just want to thank you for worshiping with us today. May God lead you to the direction of somebody who needs to hear the gospel this week. Have a blessed and wonderful day and try to stay dry. And <laughs>